uh, I'd like you all to join with me and welcome uh, Simon Coveney, Minister for Food and Marine. So, uh, Simon, please join us here. Well, Akhorja, Agus, Agina Yushla, Tori Mader, Mavan Shah, Anukt, Agus Kurum Falcherov, Guler. Can I thank uh, uh, every uh, member of the council uh, who is here? Uh, and can I thank your president of the Irish chapter, Michael, uh, for his good humour uh, and, and, of course, uh, his um, uh, control of ceremonies uh, this evening? Um, uh, it's a privilege for me to be asked to come uh, and speak to you tonight, uh, and I was delighted to, to accept when I was asked to do it. Uh, like so many Irish people of my generation, um, I have grown up uh, in a way that from time to time has uh, resulted in strong links uh, and distant links uh, with the United States. Uh, as a student working as a lifeguard uh, in Ocean City, uh, uh, enjoying myself, uh, to, to travelling uh, to Washington when I was in the European Parliament uh, as part of the EU-US uh, committee there, uh, to an agricultural minister uh, uh, travelling to meet uh, Secretary of State Tom Vilsack uh, to try and talk about uh, Irish beef accessing the, Europe, uh, the, the US market again, uh, to travelling as a young uh, backbencher in opposition uh, to try and lobby for uh, immigration reform uh, in, in the United States for the tens of thousands of Irish people uh, who are looking to regularise their position there. Uh, and I think I'm, you know, I am the norm in Ireland uh, in terms of constant connections uh, across the Atlantic uh, with a, a country that Ireland regards uh, as, as a partner, a friend, uh, um, uh, and really maintains an extraordinary relationship uh, politically, commercially, emotionally, uh, from a family point of view. Uh, and that continues and is probably stronger now than it has ever been. Uh, and one of the, um, the amazing statistics actually of the last five years when Ireland has been going through a tough period is that the capital investment by US companies in Ireland in the last five years is more than the previous 60 years combined. And that is the faith that corporate America has uh, in Ireland, even in the difficult times. And they're not doing it out of sympathy or charity. They're doing it because Ireland is a platform for international trade that they believe in. Uh, we are genuine partners here in building international business from the platform that is Ireland. Uh, that has got a strong endorsement from Forbes magazine last week in terms of a place to do business internationally. The investment we've seen in the last five years in Ireland from US firms is roughly equivalent to all of the investment that US firms have made on the continent of Asia, uh, on this little island. Uh, it's quite extraordinary. And I'm, I'm glad that Stuart really emphasized that point because often in Ireland, we take the norm for granted. We take our connections and our contacts and our relationships with the US in some ways for granted. I live in Cork. Uh, within 10 minutes of my home, uh, there are multiple US companies and corporations in the pharmaceutical sphere, in the ITC sphere, uh, um, and in a whole series of other areas. And so many of, of, of you here also this evening work for those companies uh, or live next to them uh, or are married to people who work there. Um, uh, and it is and remains a real priority uh, for the Irish government at the very, very top level to maintain and enhance and build on this relationship that is mutually beneficial um, uh, between the United States and Ireland. And that's why I think this council uh, is such an important network uh, and structure for enhancing and developing those personal relationships which lead to commercial relationships uh, the, the programs that you run, the young people that you believe in and offer scholarships to will be future advocates for the kind of thinking uh, around uh, partnership and ambition uh, that are two countries, the, the David and the Goliath together, uh, that have produced such impressive results. Uh, I think it is also important to note 
uh, the, that this is a two-way relationship. From an employment point of view, uh, as, as, as Stuart was saying, there are actually more people employed in the US by Irish or Irish-linked companies than there are in Ireland by US companies, which is amazing uh, in many ways. Uh, um, but I think it just re reinforces uh, uh, the, the two-way relationship uh, uh, that, um, that continues to grow and, uh, and develop. Uh, this is an important week for Ireland. Um, uh, at the end of this week on Sunday, um, Ireland will leave our uh, assistant pro assistance program uh, with, with the Troika, uh, known in Ireland as the bailout. Um, I don't think it's something we should be crowing about, but I think it is something that, that needs to be recognised. Uh, Ireland never before uh, was unable to raise uh, sufficient resources to simply pay the bills. Uh, that's what happened to Ireland a number of years ago, where we literally uh, ran out of, uh, of money uh, uh, and the ability to be able to borrow money in the normal way. Uh, and we had to commit to emergency funding uh, that had a whole series of strings attached. Uh, and I think that uh, in recent years, we have renegotiated that agreement uh, to improve um, the, uh, uh, the conditions uh, in terms of servicing debt, in particular, from an Irish perspective. Uh, and now, uh, despite uh, the fact that really nobody gave this country a chance uh, up until about eight months ago uh, of successfully coming out uh, and terminating uh, the bailout and normalizing uh, the Irish economy in terms of how it's financed uh, into next year, uh, that is now happening. Uh, and I think it's a reflection of how Ireland is perceived actually from outside, uh, more so than how we perceive ourselves. Uh, people want to invest in Ireland again. People want to lend money uh, to Ireland uh, in, this, in the strong belief that they'll get their money back, plus competitive rates of interest. Uh, people see a rebuilt banking system here that's not perfect, but it certainly is moving back into the normality space. Uh, people can see now that the Irish economy, despite all of the challenges that we have faced and that Europe is facing, has delivered growth in the last two years and will continue to see an acceleration in that growth going into next year. People can see uh, that two and a half years ago uh, in Ireland, uh, we were um, losing about 1,500 jobs a week. Uh, and as a small economy, uh, that takes its toll. Uh, now the Irish economy is creating about 1,000 jobs a week in the private sector. Um, we are turning this country around together uh, because of the sacrifices that Irish people have been willing to stomach, and that hasn't been easy. Uh, but through that transition, uh, over that five-year period, uh, the commitment and the faith that has remained in corporate America, in Ireland as a place to do business and to build business and to invest heavily has remained absolutely steadfast. In fact, it's increased. Uh, and uh, as Ireland now moves into a new phase of sustainable growth, uh, as I believe we are, and I'll talk a little bit about my own sector in a second, uh, I think that that partnership will develop uh, in an even more ambitious way than we've seen in the past. Uh, and I think part of that development uh, will need to be uh, an improved commercial relationship between the United States and the European Union. Uh, and that is why one of the key priorities of the Irish presidency, when we had the responsibility to give political leadership at a European level, even while we were in the midst of a bailout, uh, was to try and get real discussion going on the beginning uh, of a new bilateral trade agreement between the United States uh, and the European Union. Uh, and many people were very cynical about that on both sides of the Atlantic. And I experienced that last summer uh, uh, in Washington. Uh, and I certainly experienced it on multiple occasions uh, at council meetings in Brussels uh, and Strasbourg, uh, or Brussels and, and Luxembourg. Uh, um, but it's happened. And it's moving now into its third round of discussions and negotiations. And I think the positivity and the optimism around getting a result is probably stronger than it's ever been. Uh, and Ireland, not only in my view, uh, is part of this negotiation, but I think it has to be a leader in this negotiation. Uh, we are geographically between these two continents. Uh, we are emotionally, in my view, dragged between the United States 
uh, and the European Union, and we certainly are politically also, and from a commercial point of view, we are the gateway uh, into the European Union for so many US companies. Uh, uh, and, and so we are a natural advocate uh, for a progressive and real um, development of a, of a trade agreement that will, in my view, dramatically assist the Irish economy uh, and the, the ongoing relationship between Ireland and the United States uh, in terms of a, a trade relationship into the future. Uh, of course, one of the most difficult elements of this uh, negotiation will be agriculture, uh, will be agricultural products, will be regulation around agriculture, everything from hormones and beef uh, to uh, regulations around BSE rules uh, to steroid, steroid usage uh, uh, to, uh, to, to bioenergy product and waste material and how that's treated and categorised. Uh, to, to GM uh, and the regulations around approval for GM research and GM products. These aren't easy things to resolve. Um, they really are not. Uh, uh, but they will need to be resolved, or at least we, need, we, we will need to find a way to sideline some of them uh, uh, if we are to get a deal across the line um, in the not too distant future. Uh, but I think there is good news coming from the European Union from an agri-food and agricultural policy perspective. Uh, one of the other big achievements of the Irish presidency was to finalize a new common agricultural policy for the European Union. Uh, and the big change uh, in the common agricultural policy for the next seven years is actually a, a move away from the protectionism of the past that we have seen within the European Union. Uh, and, and the United States is trying to do something similar with a farm bill hasn't quite managed to do it yet, but is moving in that direction. Uh, and, and we are moving away from, for example, deliberate supply controls to create artificially high prices in the European Union to keep farmers in business. Uh, that's why you're seeing an end to milk quotas in the European Union in April 2015. You're seeing an end to sugar quotas in September 2017. Uh, because Europe has now recognised and Ireland is a major driver behind this, that actually we must produce food in a global context, as opposed to simply producing food for European consumers and importing cheap food to make up the difference in terms of demand. Uh, and, and Ireland, of course, is, is already very used to this. And there are many UK, uh, US companies that have invested uh, uh, in that international food perspective here. Um, and one of the reasons why I was in Chicago last month uh, was to speak to big players, companies like Abbott, companies like Mead Johnson, uh, who are big players in the infant formula business, uh, um, uh, and look at Ireland uh, as the safest place to source high quality premium dairy product, to make the most sensitive dairy product on the market globally, which is infant formula. Uh, and now Ireland is producing about 12% of the world's infant formula here in Ireland. Uh, uh, and that um, uh, industry, uh, will grow further uh, in the coming years. Because if you want to get a sense of our ambition in the food sector, uh, we are planning post-2015, when we remove the straitjacket from our dairy producers in Ireland, we are planning to be the fastest growing dairy producer on the planet uh, for at least five, if not 10 years. Uh, we're planning for a 50% volume growth in five years, uh, close to a 20% volume growth in the year immediately following the, the abolition of dairy quotas. Uh, and, and we are not really interested in the commodity trading business from that product in terms of trading uh, skimmed and semi-skimmed milk powders. Instead, we are in the added value uh, uh, business uh, of creating infant formula, sports nutrition drinks, uh, um, uh, ingredients from the dairy industry, uh, uh, whey products, um, uh, high-end cheeses and butters. Uh, and so on. And the research around that uh, premium product development in Ireland uh, is of real interest to, to the United States, uh, and we have some fantastic partnerships as we speak developing between Irish and US companies, along with Irish government agencies who are also financing that. Uh, so uh, I see, uh, unlike some people have in the past, um, the, the European Union from an agri-food and agriculture point of view uh, uh, developing an industry that recognizes the reality that globally we have to find a way of producing 50% more food in volume terms in less than 30 years to meet current consumption demand. 
Uh, and we have to find a way of doing that in a sustainable way that protects water supplies, that protects biodiversity, that limits greenhouse gas emissions, um, that, um, uh, that measures and manages energy use as part of that challenge. Uh, and only the combined uh, intelligence uh, and research capacity uh, of countries like the United States and continents like the European Union uh, or unions like the European Union can we overcome those challenges uh, in a global context. And that is why the United States is, is not only looking east to the European Union in terms of partnership in these areas, but is certainly looking west also. Uh, in terms of the political agreements that they're looking to deliver in terms of the Trans-Pacific Agreement uh, that is also very much under consideration in Washington. Um, so for me, uh, as a minister with responsibility for, for agriculture, food and marine, uh, uh, in the sectors that I'm responsible for, uh, uh, we are seeing uh, exciting new partnerships develop. Uh, on the food side, our largest food company by far, uh, Kerry Group, uh, has its headquarters in Beloit, just outside Chicago. Uh, uh, it now has a turnover of about six billion US dollars a year and employs 24,000 people, many of them in the United States. Uh, our biggest dairy producer is, um, uh, is Glanbia. Again, a really significant presence in the United States, developing new partnerships there. Uh, and the, the list goes on. Uh, um, if you look at our, at our drink sector, uh, the fastest growing um, spirit, in fact, the fastest growing alcoholic drink uh, uh, in the United States and across the world at the moment is actually Irish whiskey. Uh, uh, and there's no reason why that can't continue at a pace. There was a time, you know, when the Irish whiskey industry was as big, if not bigger, than the Scotch, uh, Scottish whiskey industry. Uh, and so the competition is now starting again, uh, as far as we're concerned. Uh, um, uh, and we're moving in the right direction. You know, it's been over 100 years since we saw a distillery built in this country. We currently have six under construction. Um, and we have some very significant players um, in that sector and in that industry here with us this evening, I'm very pleased to say. Uh, but it's not all about food and drink. Uh, in the marine area, uh, we have made very significant progress towards uniting the ambitions uh, in terms of research uh, linked to the Atlantic resource that stands between us. Um, uh, um, um, with the United States and Canada uh, and the European Union. And actually, uh, this year we signed what was called the Galway Declaration, uh, which is linking Europe's ambitions for an Atlantic strategy uh, with the US and Canada's ambition uh, for an Atlantic research program, uh, uh, which they are uh, motivated by and funding now. And I'm delighted that, that Peter Heffernan from the Marine Institute is here because he is in many ways the architect uh, of that declaration uh, and that level of ambition around building business and commerce and research around the extraordinary resource that is the Atlantic. Uh, and in many ways, uh, it has been the Atlantic that has separated Ireland and the United States in the past. Uh, it has been the, the vehicle that has carried so many thousands of Irish people away from this island looking for a better future in the United States. Uh, and in my view, in the future, it will be the Atlantic that pulls us closer together uh, in terms of the extraordinary commercial opportunities that are there, in terms of the natural resources uh, uh, that lie between uh, the, the, uh, the sea surface and seabed, and indeed the natural resources that, that lie below the seabed. Uh, and we already have a number of strategic research partnerships under run, uh, underway in that transatlantic partnership where Irish research vessels are combining, uh, are, are combining uh, with, um, with universities uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. So this is uh, a relationship that is evolving, that has an extraordinarily strong base or foundation, uh, where Ireland and the United States uh, have this bond uh, that when we are in difficulty, we turn to you in the United States. Uh, and we do it unashamedly uh, because we know uh, the kind of response that we get. When, when US companies look to Europe in terms of expansion and growth, they look to Ireland as their platform and their base, uh, one that they can trust even in difficult times. When lots of other people look at Ireland and see a basket case, uh, you looked at Ireland and said, they will get through this and come out stronger the other side. Uh, and I think that, that that type of relationship that has been tested in the last five years 
uh, uh, in my view, uh, is now on the verge of, uh, of, uh, of moving to a new phase uh, of growth, uh, of political engagement around Ireland giving European leadership uh, uh, on, a, on a new transatlantic trade agreement. Uh, and, and certainly from my perspective, um, agriculture and the marine uh, and the food industry generally and drinks industry uh, uh, will play a major part in that. Uh, we will see companies like Alltech uh, continuing to invest both here and in Kentucky and in all of the other countries that they invest in as a proud Irish company with very strong roots in, in the United States. Um, we will continue to see Aer Lingus to, to grow and expand uh, and maintain its strong brand which is so linked to Ireland uh, and its reputation particularly in the United States. Um, and I think we can look forward with, um, with real promise. Uh, but there's one thing we should not do, uh, and that is that we should not take this relationship for granted. Uh, and that is why uh, the, uh, the, the, this council uh, is one of the many vehicles that maintains that relationship, uh, that continues to introduce new people and a new generation uh, to um, the uh, the relationship that is a special one that continues bet uh, between um, our two countries. Uh, and that is why I want to thank you uh, for, for all that you do. Uh, I want to thank Michael and through Michael uh, uh, all of the other key personalities that make this council tick and make it work. Um, it's a shame you didn't invite me to speak in Florida actually in, in February. <laughs> that, would have been, that would have been a um, hard to turn down. Uh, um, but uh, actually, I'm going to Boston in, uh, uh, to, to Harvard in, um, uh, in, uh, in, in January uh, um, uh, to, to, to speak at, a, at an agri-food conference there, uh, which again is actually focusing on, uh, uh, on European agri-food policy and US agri-food policy uh, and how they're moving towards each other in terms of inter internationalizing uh, uh, their focus um, um, on, on food production and competitiveness in that area. So look, can I finish by, uh, by uh, wishing all of you a very happy Christmas. Uh, uh, um, for those of you who are going home to the United States, uh, uh, have a safe trip. I suspect most of you are staying in Ireland. Uh, but uh, let's not take this relationship for granted. As we move into 2014, there are very exciting opportunities uh, for many U.S. companies who will continue, I know, to invest in Ireland because it makes sense to do so. Uh, and we will continue to look to the U.S. for opportunities for Irish companies. Uh, we are on the verge uh, of, uh, of selling beef again uh, to the U.S. So uh, people, you'll see an awful lot more people like Stuart, much taller, uh, um, because of the quality of the, of the beef that they'll be eating. Uh, in fact, in fact, that's one thing we share. Uh, um, uh, I've said that when we get Irish beef uh, back into the US market, it's called green beef over there because it's grass-fed. Um, uh, and it has about a 30% price premium, particularly on the East Coast, um, because of its grass-fed nature. Uh, but we see real opportunities for the Irish agri-food sector, but particularly uh, in the next 12 months for, for beef entering that market. And I've promised that I'd go to Washington and, uh, uh, and personally cook steaks on a barbecue uh, um, for free for the passers-by um, when, when and if that happens. Um, but uh, thank you again for, for this evening, uh, and thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a real pleasure, and I look forward to meeting um, a lot of you uh, once the formalities are over. Thank you.